Folks, welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show, and we're joined here today by a legend and uh, part of the lineage of music and a, an amazing trumpet player, Wayne Cobham. Welcome to the Jake Feinberg Show. Hey, Jake. How are you? Let me, why did you, tell me a little bit about, uh, you know, I was born in 78, and okay. I want you to talk about Dizzy and Miles <laughs> and Louie. Uh, uh, who were the shaman trumpet players that you wanted to, that you didn't necessarily, that you were borrowing and stealing from at all costs? Well, let me check, can I, I take a, a little Go piece? wherever you want. Yeah. Okay, so there was a drummer, his name was, um, uh, Baby Sweets, he's the uh, he used to play drums, uh, little cafe kit. Uh, Walter Perkins was his real name. He played at a little cafe bass drum, one riding tom, a hi hat, one cymbal, and he played the crap out of it. Um, I was going to Man I was going to Manhattan School of Music. I thought I could play. I was studying jazz and prog, uh, and I said, okay, you know. I went to I was coming home and in this little jazz club across from where we lived out in Queens. These guys were jamming, so I walked into the club and I asked the guys. I said, hey. You know, and I walked in and I was going to listen. Uh, he asked me, say, hey man, is that a trumpet? I said, yeah. He says, oh, you want to jam? I said, sure. So he says, okay, next set. Okay, next set came and <laughs> called me up. I don't know what the song was, but I played what I thought was hip. At the end of the set, he says, hey kid, man, you know, where do you go to school? I said, oh, I got a mad school of music. He said, oh yeah, I thought so. He said, what was that bull crap you were playing, man? That ain't jazz. <laughs> You know, he just, he just ripped me a new butt, which, in a, in a loving way. Right. But he says, so, same kind of question you just asked me. He says, so, who do you like? What, what, what kind of trumpet players do you like? And I said, well, I really like Miles. He said, well, why do you like Miles? I said, because he's got the birth of the cool. He was into his electronics, man. He'd, he, well, I knew he could play, but then he was taking, he was taking us to the, to the cosmos. Blah, 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 you know, doing this really deep stuff. And uh, so he says, okay, uh, who else do you like? And I said, Dizzy. He said, why do you like Dizzy? I said, because Dizzy's solos and the things that Dizzy did as a soloist, um, there was some lyricism in Dizzy's playing. And also, um, he was doing the bebop thing with Charlie Parker and, they were, Parker, and they were creating that stuff, and that was really hip. But also, what people didn't realize, Dizzy had an incredible register. He could play the crap out of it in the upper register, and nice and bop up there, too. So I said, okay, well, that's kind of cool. Um, so, okay, is he anybody else? And I said, well, Freddie Hubbard. He mm -hmm. said, well, why Freddie Hubbard? I said, because outside of Mark Farmer, whose flugelhorn tone I used to adore, Freddie's flugelhorn sound was round and it was great. And so I emulated Freddie. Billy played with Freddie, so I got a chance to hang out and see Freddie up front, up and close and personal. And Freddie could really just, you know, when Freddie was on, all the other trumpet players just took their mouthpieces out and sat down. Cause well, all the cats that play, you know, Carl Burnett, uh, Henry the Skipper Franklin, they all, they all said, for as insane as Freddie could could be, when he was on, when he was on, was nobody better. nobody touched Freddie. But you're you're older than Billy, right? I mean, you're, oh, you're no, I'm the baby brother. You're the baby brother. I'm, I'm cuter. <laughs> I I, oh, I love so so. I mean, well, I mean, can you talk a little bit about? So you literally didn't even realize that you had the Academy sound. I mean, that's what the cat was saying. Who was the cat, by the way? The, the jam session that was asking you all this. Yeah, this, this, this was, uh, this, uh, this was um, Walter Perkins. So, Walter Perkins. Okay, well, so, so y <laughs> you weren't even aware that you had, that you sounded like you were coming out of the school. Yeah, no, I, I didn't. You know, but you know, I, was, I was in classical studies, so, you know, I was, I was playing classical, man, trying to, trying to, you know, trying to play precise with precision and with a good sound and a good tone. And when uh, you know, Billy and I both grew up in, in this whole drum and bugle called marching band thing, <clears throat> and, and coming out of that genre of music, it was about playing precise and precision. You had maybe you had 30, 40 trumpets, you know, 30, 40 trombones and so on, and you had to play exact precision. I was at March at the same time, so that's what that was my background. That's what I, you know, that was my lineage at that time. And I was I was trying to be the cleanest, the most precise player, but in jazz and popular music, that's not always the case, you know? No, it's not, and uh, I, I guess my, that, that's a good follow-up is, when did you start to get, for lack of a better word, cooking the grease? When did you start getting dirtier or realizing that um, the, that bugle and drum corps thing wasn't really part of the jazz, <coughs> jazz aesthetic? Me. Well, you know, in our, in, our, in our neighborhood, we grew up in, uh, in Jamaica, Queens, and, uh, and uh, 
in, in a lot of years. And uh, there was a community um, of a lot of great musicians outside of the Jamaica Queens area. You had St. Albans, you had South Jamaica, and it was a it was a home to a lot of the great musicians um, and the jazz musicians of our time. Milt and, Jackson lived there. Who, who lived there? Absolutely, you had Milt Jackson was there. Um, well, outside of that, James uh, James Brown had a house out there. He did. But uh, um, let's see. John B. Harry, Williams, maybe. Harry, was it? Yep. Harry Sweets Edison was there. Sweets was there. Sweets was there. He had a club. Oh, this is uh, insane. Yeah, uh, on um, on Linden, on Linden and Merrick Boulevard there that we all could play, you know, come and jam. So there's a lot of guys, you know, they, they got out of the city, they did their gigs, they did their sessions, they played 52nd Street, and then they came and lived out in the suburbs. So um, in our little clique of, of neighborhoods there, there was, there was this one vast unit of, 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 of co-ops called Rochdale Village where a lot of cats grew up in and around that. Um, Marcus Miller, Tom Brown, Donald Blackman, uh, and on and on, Lenny White, um, you know, there was just tons of people. It was just like a, a, a mecca of music. And what we, what I always used to say, and I, I continue to say, back in that era for us, we didn't have gangs, we had bands. So if, if, I, if I knew, Jay, you were going to be playing on the corner of 130th Avenue and Bedell Street, I'm going to get my band on the corner of 131st and Bedell, and I play the same day that you did, and whoever pulled the crowd, was the baddest band. It was a cut session. It was a cut session. I yeah. did, but it was completely melodic. It was, yeah, and it was, it was so it was, freaking cool. And it was, it was what we used to do to, to learn. You know, um, we, it was necessary. You know, I dabbled more. Um, where Billy went from drum corps thing into into swing jazz with, with, with Horace Silver and, and Miles and those other things, and then later on to the rock thing, heavy rock fusion thing with, with John McLaughlin. Um, I was in the R&B. I was trying to find, I was trying to weave my pattern, my way in and around that, because as a Cobham, and especially a younger Cobham, Billy had already laid down the heritage in front of me, the lineage in front of me, where, and it was a good thing. It was a good thing, because I learned a lot from it, but then it also had its, had its bumps in the road, because sometimes, you know, um, I mean, there was there's times when people would applaud me for being Billy's brother and accept me for being Billy's brother, but, but there was times also, if they didn't particularly like Billy, or they got fired from a band with Billy, I got fired from a band with them because of that. And that was, that was cool too, you know. I mean, it was cool, my, yeah, yeah. get my mind together. And, um, Unbelievable. So, so I mean, the, 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 so from the earliest time, how much younger are you than Billy? Seven years. Okay, so you came in, really you started yeah. cutting your teeth when... Kind of R and B. I will just talk about your R and B roots. I mean, where does it go? Where did those go back to? Were you? Was it? Was um, it Cool in the Gang? I mean, where? where was I did it? Cool in the Gang. I did Cameo. I played with the Temptations. Uh, my first real uh, gig leaving out the continental United States uh, was, with a, was a guy that I loved until the day he passed. It's not Benny King. I was, I was in Benny King's band. Benny King's band. Yeah, and uh, you know, I went to, went to Japan. I always, I always remember. Uh, I went to Japan, we had to do a month in Japan with Benny King, the plane takes off, and I, I didn't even know what to charge. He said, what do you want, you know, what do you want to get paid? I didn't know, I had to call my brother and I called a bass player friend named Tom Barney, and Tom Barney said, you know, what you should ask for. And so that was him. But then on the plane as it took off from Kennedy Airport, when they said, you know, you can unfasten the seatbelt, Benny came down the aisle to all the musicians and dropped the envelope in our laps. And it was cash money, paid in full. And I was blown up. My mom was blown. I got like a couple thousand dollars. Here. I hadn't even played a note, you know. And I was like, "This is how it is in the music business. This is great." Oh man, you know? ear to ear, dude. <laughs> but you know, um, that was with, a, with an established cat. That was an established cat. He was really great, and uh, he uh, he was a loving. He was a friend, a mentor, and uh, I can't say enough about him, you know, to the end. But yeah, uh, yeah it's like I said before, cameo, brass construction. I started becoming a, 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 a trumpet guy, but then there's two Wayne Cobbles, and I, and I say that with, uh, with, with love and, and affection about two. So there's the Wayne Cobble that a lot of people know as a trumpet player, brass player, that kind of thing. But um, I, I was dating a young lady um, who worked for TWA, TWA Airing, or Airlines rather, sure. and um, it was really cool, she, and she knew I was producing a lot of artists and things like that. She said, hey, I can sing, why don't you produce me? And I said, yeah, you don't really want to sing, come on. But you know, although she had a voice, she said, but I want to get away from TWA, I want to do something else with my life. And But she could really type really fast on a regular typewriter. Word processing was just coming into the fore. 
And so she thought, maybe I can become a word processor. So I, I funded some money, I gave her some money to go learn um, a, a computer called Wang. There was a system called Wang, W-A-N-G, in Manhattan on 6th Avenue. But what year was this, by the way? Mm, this has got to be early, early 70s. And computers, and computers were, were, were they, they, what, what did they look like? Yeah, I mean, they, they were huge, they were, they were Wang. Huge, man. So she went, um, she went, no, she went, she graduated for, uh, from with Wang, learning a word processing thing, using IBM ATs and XTs. And uh, so I asked her, you know, what do you want for Christmas? She said, well, I want to start my own business, word processing. I want a computer. So I said, what's a computer? What's it mean? She said, I need something that's got two five and a quarter floppies and 64K of RAM. I said, okay, that's etched in my mind. Um, I go down 48th Street in Manhattan, which used to be Musicians Row between 7th and 6th Avenue, and I passed a, a, a music store called Alex Music. And in the, in, the, in the window of Alex Music was a computer. It was an Apple IIe. It had 64K of RAM and two five and a quarter floppies. Computer shooter. I, had, I bought this computer. I gave it to her, I wrapped it up for Christmas. She ripped it open at Christmas time. And she says, what's that? I said, hey, that's your computer. You can do your word processing. She says, no, I ain't learned on a Wang. I learned on an IBM. This is not an IBM, that's an that's a Apple. I don't know anything about Apple. I said, no, no, no. You didn't give me a brand. You said it had to be 64K, two five and a quarter floppies. Dig this. And she got pissed at me. And sat with a dust cover on it for maybe four or five months. A good friend of mine, who's still to this day a great friend, his name is Benny Russell, he's out of yeah. Baltimore, a great sax player and arranger. He came over to my house one day with a, with a, a magazine, it was called Soft Talk. And on the cover of the magazine was a, was, a, uh, was a guy, his name was Brian Bell. If you don't know him, people should look him up. Brian Bell was the electronic programmer for Herbie Hancock. Did all Herbie Hancock's things. And Brian was, and was discussing how he used an Apple IIe and this plug-in daughter board device to create a 64 voice polyphonic synthesizer called this. And I said, what, whoa, you could do, you could do music on a computer? And I gave, he gave me the book and I started reading it and reading it and reading about source code and, and Unix code and writing ProDOS and okay, so I started coming up with my own little things with this, with this little computer creating musical tunes. And then um, there, was, there was a device that you need to, you know, the, the, the basis of creating any of the sound waves with, with basically three waves. It was a sawtooth wave, a square wave, and a sine wave. We're, we're the basis of pretty much all the sounds that are created there uh, electronically. And so I didn't, they had, Apple had joysticks that you had to draw them out, and, and I, I didn't have them. Joy, joysticks had been discontinued. So I started looking at the source code. I decompiled the source code for the program, because I, I I'm a nut. I, You're a freak. This I'm is unbelievable. Crazy. I'm a geek. I'm a geek. So I decompiled the source code and I was looking at the XY ratios of different uh, parameters and I said, hmm, if I change this, if I change this, it will give me automatically on startup the basis of the, of the three sine waves that I need to create. So I did that on my, and uh, it was working for me and I'm creating my tunes, I'm creating my sounds. And the same guy, Benny came over my house, man, I showed him one day and he said, oh man, that's great. You should let the company know, man, what you're doing. Maybe, maybe you'll get something. I said, what are you going to give me? Right, long story short, <clears throat> I called the company up. I sent them a five and a quarter floppy of what I was doing, and they were amazed. They said, listen, man, we'd like to use this. How about we send you $500 for the use of this, and we put you on our software development team, which was great. Because now, and you had no it, academic background in this stuff. No, I just read. This is this is this is because this is totally antithetical to yeah, what goes just, on today. This is, I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. It's just crazy. So <clears throat> they put me on their software development team, and we do things. I'm doing uh, demos for them of the software and the, and the devices for Sam Ash and other music stores. Then one day, one day the salesman came to me and he says, "Man, something coming out. It's new. It's going to totally revolutionize music." I said, "What's that?" He says, "It's called MIDI." I said, "What's MIDI?" Musical instrument, digital face. What's that? Well, hey, you could take a Korg device, plug it into a Yamaha device, plug that into a Roland device, play the Korg device, and they're all going to play at the same time. Plus, you can plug it into your computer and you can record that. I said, really? He said, yeah, man, this is crazy. So, I became on uh, a pioneer of doing that. Um, part of Billy's, uh, Billy was doing when he, his warning album. When Billy was doing warning album, he had uh, he was using some electronics, using some Oberheim gear. And you know, there's different manufacturers had their own clock source, different things. You had Oberheim, you had Lin, you had Emu. They all had the different. Some was 24 pulse beats, uh, 48, 92, and so on. Um, so Billy had done a lot of free work uh, at home in Switzerland using some Oberheim stuff, and he brought it to the states. And 
you know, trying to drop this, drop these tracks, drop the so I'll stripe a, you know, stripe the two or four inch tape with with a source code and then sync it, and we were having a lot of trouble. So I imported his stuff into this computer that I just had, which is a new thing called MIDI, and you know, we did a lot of the album and that stuff from there. I want to ask you. I want to go back to the music. I mean, what what was your true feelings about? Groups like Mahavishnu, Return to Forever, and Weather Report. Uh, I, part of me, in, in my gut, I, I feel like Billy does these retreats because he wants to. Well, it's the art of the rhythm section, right. and it, music, for better or for worse, Billy became known as this fusion drummer. But right. he started in the dynamic bag of Horace Silver, exactly. and I feel like in some ways the music got louder and louder and louder and louder, Where and then dynamics kind of went away, so everything's operating at a decibel of 10. Yes. Can you talk about like when you started to hear the music fundamentally losing dynamics and just getting louder, and was it partially, res were, were groups like Mahavishnu mm -hmm. responsible for that? Not I would say they had a part in it, but not not completely. No, they, of they, course they didn't own it on on their own because the music music was shifting. Yeah, cats were looking for new things and new ways to play. Um, I, the, the the groups used to play. You said uh, Billy with Mob was do. You had uh, Foz Blues on with, uh, with, with I forgot that. Miroslav Vitrus. Yeah, and, and he uh, also Zoe Nolan. Yeah, and all those cats. And they play. And if, so Billy, if Billy had thirteen drums on stage, Alfonso would have twenty, and Lenny would have. 30. Oh, they'd have like triple. Yeah, yeah everybody was doing the, the ultra drum thing, trying to make it happen. Wow! But there was a shift in the groove, uh, you know. Um, yeah, Marvish, well, talk about that shift because I we Marvish, weren't around for that. Yeah, I was I was lucky because my mom had to work, uh, my my mother, and uh, it was just mom, Billy, and I at the time, and uh, and I was young, young, some years younger. Somebody had to watch me, had to babysit me, so I really dragged my butt to rehearsals. You know, so, oh, that's great. Um, so I'm sitting out there at, at either bed. There used to be a rehearsal studio downtown Manhattan called Baggies, and I'm sitting Baggies. Ba you, wait, wait, hold on. This because I, I talked to Billy McLaughlin was at a session. He's like, just come down, you and me, at Baggies all day, all night. All night, Baggies. And you were that you were hanging. Yeah, I was at oh, this is unreal. Yes, yeah, hanging at Baggies. So I'm sitting in the back, and I'm watching these guys. Uh, that you know, they're they're working stuff out, man. There was there was no chart. Nobody sat down with a chart and say, okay, play this. You know, um, John would come out and say, well, I got this feeling. It's like, nah, 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 nah. and they'd say, okay, they, 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 they were putting it together. Instant arrangement. They were making it happen. I love it. Right, right at the time. And what worked didn't work. They, they just, you know, sold it all together to make it what it became. Um, not knowing, I, I, and I'm not even sure if they were caring about success. They were, they were on the bridge of this new thing, this new discovery, this new way of, to express themselves. I think... Uh, some of the stuff uh, and the openness of music, because music got a little bit freer. Miles did Bitches Brew, and the Ornette was doing his thing, and so many people just started to be more experimental. Sun Ra was doing his thing, and there's some. The drop in the bar lines, yeah, you know, I mean, the whole there thing. Was, there was no time signatures in some of the music. I mean, uh, did, did, did jazz become an inside joke for jazz musicians, meaning. Peep, regular blue collar cats could lost track of the, the actual tune itself. They stopped being able to tap tap their foot to it. Right. I'm just trying because I, I for a long time on my journey I've realized that like at first I used to think it was a supply and demand issue, meaning more musicians than venues, but now actually it's a patronage issue. Is no. right? Yeah, it could be in a lot of ways because you know um, even 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 today if you're at a point where if you cast some tough say you know what what tunes do you know and can you can you blow over the changes you can't blow over the changes you know go home really uh, and so and so but it was but for the for that era for the era of Diz and and and, and Miles they they were their own students and teachers they taught each other they they were able to hang with each other. And, and, and play and, and, and Dizzy hit Miles do something really great and he said, oh man, I gotta check that out, let's do this. And it became that language. They, they created a whole new language that nobody else was doing prior to that. You know, um, so it was, it was a good thing. Uh, it, was, it was a pioneering phrase. Where, how, do, how, do you how do you oscillate, vacillate between electronic and human music? And how have you done that? Did you ever get to a point where it was like, man, I'm addicted to the, I'm, I'm, I'm too into the, the, the the automation as opposed to the human heart. I mean, how did you how did you balance the, it? The 
the electronics became two things. I mean, you had, the, you had the electronic sounds that people were doing, which had, had its own era, and everybody picked up on it. Randy Brecker was playing electronically. Uh, Eddie Henderson played electronically, and on and on and on. I mean, I had, and I'm following in the footsteps because I'm, you know, I'm like, yo, they're, they're my idols. Like, they're You're talking that. about the wah pedals and stuff? Wah pedals. Yeah, because Randy, play, I just want to be clear for the record, Randy was the, Miles came and saw Randy playing the wah pedal mm -hmm. on his trumpet. Yep. Uh, and, 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 and a thing called a, a maestro. Um, what's a maestro? A maestro was a box, a, a sound creation box. So you you you, oh, you plug the you, you drill the hole into your mouthpiece and you put the you put the pickup in the mouthpiece because it was the truest sound. And then you plugged it into this box called a maestro, and by pressing different buttons, you got different sounds, different gradients of sound. That's a, you hear a lot of stuff of uh, Randy solos through the Dreams Band and so on using that kind of technique. And, it was, it was, and Eddie was doing that. Eddie was oh, also doing that. Absolutely. Oh man. So, so I, you know, so of course I had to have one of those. I had to have some wild wild photos. I, I played with a, a percussionist called Don Umarmao. Are you kidding me? Played rest played in peace. He's long. He's rest in peace, right? Rest in peace. He's good. Dude, the well, most nasty. So, what? Tell me about that. How do you yeah. connect with him? He was. He. Uh, I met him playing with, with, with Carlos Garnett and the oh Billy's God, brothers. Dude. I knew it was Billy's brother. He said, man, I want you to play in my band. We're going you know, to play at the bottom line. I said, great. So he says, uh, he got he had an endorsement with Mutron. And uh, they had this thing called a biphase. It was two, two, phases, two phases in one box. And you could set the modulation to alter. And all he wanted was, listen, I don't want lines. I want sounds. So that was the, uh, <laughs> that was the craziest thing. Wait, Carlo, Carlos was saying that? No. Um, Dom. Dom Oon. And uh, he, he had a guy named Bjorn from Brazil that came in and played sax, and and we just played. We just played creative stuff, man, based on his chord changes that he had in his mind while he played the better bow and his other, other percussion gadgets. Uh, the, going back, though, striking that balance between authentic, authentic human music and, and the digital realm, being that you were a pioneer, have, do you feel like you've reached a comfortable space with that, or have there been times where you're over-reliant on it? Well, you know, I think uh, there's a comfortable space in it, and as much as that, you had the haves and the have-nots. You had all of the powerful studios that were around, um, and if you wanted to record or express an idea, or just you had something in your mind, you had to come up with some heavy bucks just to go in and tinker, or, or, or buy uh, a, you know, or buy your own real-to-real -real machine, multi-track, and and work on putting your ideas down so that you can hear it and see if it made sense. Um, when computers became came into the mix, you know it changed it changed everything. Obviously, because uh, a new cottage industry became came available. Because now anybody could just if you had an idea, you could put it in. Whether they're classified as a musician, non-musician, but you had an idea in your mind, you wanted to tap on a few sticks and make a beat or do your beatbox thing. Now you could get a, a vehicle to do that that didn't cost you an arm or a leg, and you could take your time and edit it. You know, you could, you, you could, it was like musical word processing. You could, you could blurt out everything you want and then go back in. And, and you didn't have to pay for studio time. You, you could do it in a home studio. Do it at home. It made it right. And I get it. It was good. You go to the studio and you drop it, and it was good to go. And you know, the penalty was a lot of a lot of major studios went under because when the cottage industry was taking that thing, that 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 uh, income out, that revenue away, but. The real good ones, is, you know, there's still a few really mega good ones that are there that, that I'll give you that look. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a crazy balance, man. It's, um, um, it, uh, I think the, the number was, because I'm, because I'm, I remember stupid stuff. Uh, it, it's 10 megabytes. It takes 10 megabytes of hard drive space per stereo minute. So. What does that mean to the lay? Tell, tell explain so, to the lay person what that. So means. if you're. Um, so if you're gonna record a stereo track into a computer back in the day, um, it would take 10 megabytes per stereo minute. So one minute would be 10 megabytes, uh, um, 10, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 minutes of time would take you that amount of space on a hard drive. And then, so, so then you could, you'd multiply that or by space. So if 10 megabytes per stereo minute, then it's five megabytes for four, you know, for four tracks, and so on and so on. So, and and the hard drive space back then, I think some of the earliest computers was only ten megs, twenty megs on an IBM or a Mac, or and now you got gigabytes. Cats talk about terabytes. Terabyte. I heard and them talk. Have, they've been collecting. They have three terabytes worth of stuff just from this and, and, rhythm and section. I, you know, and um, right, it's insane. And, but before and, that could take up one whole. Oh you know. yeah, man, and not, not, and they go pentabytes now. You know, so it's it's. 
it's exponential. I remember the uh, when I was going back to the old Apple II I bought with uh, with 64K of RAM. That cost me twenty three hundred dollars. That twenty three hundred dollars now will get you mm, maybe a six or eight terabyte Mac today. Today, you know, it's a, you know, if you think about it in in, in, in terms of generality. In terms Do of you money. incorporate? Uh... What have, I mean, I heard you mention Steve Jordan in there. You've been, I mean, do you how, what, how do you incorporate electronics into your live musical performance? I, I, I just started doing it again um, recently. I, I take it a high. I, I got a ton of gear, but um, I didn't have a. There wasn't a, a need for it. A was, calling? Yeah, calling for it. I, I was playing on the jazz stuff that I was doing. You know, i was just trying to play tunes and play with expression and tone and and my my interpretation of whatever those tunes may be. Um, so I wouldn't use it, maybe I'd ask a guy to give me some reverb or something on, on overall system. That was the extent of it. Um, now I'm starting to venture out a little bit more. Uh, there's some R&B things that I've been doing recently. Uh, um, about a month ago, somebody said, uh, hey man, we're doing, we're doing a, rendition, a rendition of uh, The Temptation of the Papa was a Rolling Stone. And uh, we want you to play the trumpet lead because it's trumpet solo all through the beginning of that. So I said, okay, cool. I said. Um, that I'm gonna become wireless, and I want to plug into a digital delay, so that I can recreate that sound of that of that thing that was done in the studio, so I could do that live, and uh, so I've been pull, pulling that off. How did it? Did, did, it's authentically sounding the same. Sounds the yes. same. Yes. Yeah. They will pull it off. So. Do you do production as well? I do. I, can you? This is fat, especially with live production. I've talked to the greatest engineers. Uh, you know, uh, guys like Val Gray, and there's, you know, so many cats, and, and, and it's not really, I have a really, I mean, I listen back to this period of music in the early 70s, Dreams, definitely, but, you know, anything that was going on at that time, and I'm, you know, originally I thought it was analog versus digital, but actually it's mic placement. Mic placement was, was mega. How do you mic a drum kit that, so that you get, because it, before, it, now you mic every single drum. Pretty much. But uh, before there was like a little bit of leakage was okay. I, I don't know. Right. I mean, what is your, what's your philosophy about, about like, do you, I mean, because that's what I realized. Cor Danny Korchmark told me too. They over mic the stuff. Well, you do. I'll flip it. I'll answer that question in this way. Um, all of that digital, crazy, computer related stuff that I did, MIDI, blah, 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 took me into a sampling realm where I started doing sampling for a lot of people. Um, and that sampling stuff. Uh, that, that got me a chance to work with Michael Jackson on the Dangerous and History album. I got my two Grammys for that. Um, as a sample, as a sample, as a, as a as a synth person for him, uh, for those for those two albums. Wow! And but I had a chance to work with Bruce Woodin, who's fantastic. He's just fantastic. He's ridiculous. Uh, his techniques, to mic techniques, and uh, so he. Looking at some of the stuff, and some of the, some of the stuff he, I tried to copy or mimic some of the stuff he does, but I don't have I, a third of the gear that he has to do it. But he would mic a set of drums depending on the side of the kid. He had he had the, the overhead mics for for the cymbals. He had uh, the individual individual drum mics that he had there. He also used some pickups. You know, he had pickups on the skins. He did that, um, and he was able to. He brought all that back into the, in, into his SSL console, and he and he mixed it the way that he knew it was best, and it, it made it sound like amazing. Um, he did a thing. He did a trick with uh, with a guitar solo for Michael. Um, that was interesting for me. He he took the guitar, he took the guy's Mesa boogie, placed it on on some cinder blocks, four cinder blocks, face down. He mic'd that at two points, put two room mics up brought the guitar player inside and just let him scream from there. And that blend, I was like, how'd you come up with that? You know, <laughs> where did you think of that? You know, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I guess for the guys that do it regularly, and, they, and it's also based too upon what gear you have. Right? Well, that's what, true. What you can afford. Um, <clears throat> there, was a, there was a gentleman who, whose name, I'm, I'm skipping, I hope he's still alive, was a sax player uh, with me when, um, with Cameo when we did um, She's Strange and all that kind of stuff. Uh, he had a Tascam Porter Studio cassette player, right? And, and back in the days, so you could, you could record three tracks, then you bounce that, you mix that three tracks, you bounce it back to one, to the one that was open, and then you wiped all the others, and then you recorded more tracks. 
the stuff he did on that sounded like a master. He released some of his CDs based on what he did on the Task and Porter Studio. And he said, really? It's, it's about the tool that you got, you know, um, that you know how to use. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's, that's all he had, man. And so as such, he made that work for him. And then, you know. Well, no, I mean, this is crazy. Well, you know? One thing that, uh, one reason I've connected deeply with your brother is because he respects the fact that I've basically created something out of nothing. Mm -hmm. I think your, your brother preaches the idea of saying, well, even if you have nothing, what can you create out of that, exactly. okay? Yeah. What is the new thing you can create? And I've tied humanity mm -hmm. together using technology, but doing, I'm not a musician, I'm not a, a theory-based guy, mm -hmm. but I'm letting you cats enlighten other people through wisdom and knowledge and, and you know, real, real life application. Can you talk about that? that in, where did that entrepreneurial spirit come from in your family? Well, you know, I, um, you walked into some of this stuff. You make it sound like dumb luck, but I mean, it's, it's, it's to me, it's, there's an entrepreneurial spirit there. I think going back, back, going back to history, you know, Billy was born in '44. My dad, my dad had to, uh, was was in Panama. He had this family, had a new young child. He wanted to come to America to make it. He wanted to build something great for the family. So, dad had to come over first. He was a pioneer. He had to come over here to the, to the, in the United States and, and find a job, whatever the hell job was, whether it was, was it sweeping stores or, or, or running letters from building to building for somebody, but he had to establish a job, a, a paying job, have enough money in the bank, um, which at the time, I, I found some papers, you know, um, passed that was, he had to have at least $2,000 in the bank and a sponsor, or a good friend of him or his that was here, uh, just to stay. Just to stay. Are you and, serious? I'm very serious. What year was this? Oh man, this has got to be uh, 44, about 47. And then once that, when that was happening, um, when he had that stability, he could go to go to the courts and say, "Hey, I got the money in the bank. This guy's gonna help sponsor me to bring my family over." They said, "Okay, United States, says, yeah, come on, bring your family over." So, uh, so then my mom and my brother came over. As, as, as you, uh, I didn't come along until 51. Right, you weren't even birthed yet. I wasn't even birthed yet. Yeah, right. And so I didn't come along 51, and then, you know, they're here, and they're new immigrants in this great country, and they had to work, man. You know, they had to work and, 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 and uh, present solvency, not only to stay there and pay their rent and stuff of that nature, but they had to figure it all out, because this was fine, you know. But from the, from the shores of Panama and Cologne, and uh, so this was, and, and they hung in there and they persevered. Dad's brother, my uncle, yeah. Uncle Edwin, we weren't, we weren't a rich family, not, not many by any means, uh, but only, uh, there was maybe five brothers, and only they, they wanted the family, my great grandfather wanted the kids to learn music, but they could only afford for one kid to learn. So it was my dad's older brother, um, Uncle Edwin, who was able to take music lessons piano lessons specifically. And, uh, and my dad couldn't be in the same room because there was only lessons for that one Uncle Edward. So what my dad would do is stand outside the room and lay on the floor and watch what was going on. Unbelievable. And when it was over, there you go. when the lesson was over, he'd go on and try to practice by ear what he was hearing. So dad became a, a very decent uh, piano player, um, uh, but he was ear trained. You know? I mean, would he play when the cats came over to oh, the house? Man, like, you know, in Jamaica? Definitely, he, he could play. And, uh, and he hold, held his own in doing that. Mom, mom sang, but she was, mom was the, the gospel singer. She was, the, she was that, that singer in church that had that high alto voice and that, uh, carried it to her. And then, uh, you consider it a sanctified church or more of like uh, a Baptist kind of? More of a Baptist church at that particular time, you know, for us. We, we, we were also, I remember, going to a Lutheran church. You know, to her it was like, hey, you know, it's a church, but I'm gonna pray to God. We're gonna, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna, we're gonna lay them down. Everybody's gonna come. Um, and then there was the kids. You had these the kids. You had, you had Billy, who had, you know, he Billy pick up sticks, and as he was saying in one, in one of his uh, yeah. interviews, um, 89 Choice Street between Lewis and Stuyvesant was this big park for uh, Robert Fulton Park, and uh, um, the, the shoe statues of Fulton, the kids used to knock over, people used to knock over, it was funny. But at the end of the park was a, a, a gazebo that was about a block long, where the train used to come up, the A train used to come up at the other end, and the people used to come out going home. But they had this covered area where you could do a little picnicking and stuff at the park. 
and all, all these people, Cougaros, Timbaleros, they would come in and just jam. They'd start on a, a Saturday and they'd just jam all day and you heard these rhythms, man. It was, it was great, you know, for us back then. The big thrill back then, you know, uh, we didn't have a TV, you know, so we, we read a lot. You, we wait for the ice cream man or the watermelon man to come down the block and, you know, that, that was it for kids. And we, you know, we were sworn that you had to be in by a certain time or else, you know. That did, that was what, did you guys have a chance to experience, like, the Santeria drumming of Cuba, like uh, Baba Tunde or Mongo? Because you know, Bill Summers, when he was, before he was Bill Summers, he... Mm -hmm. Came over, uh, Pablo Landrum. Uh, I heard the name. Yeah. Okay, yeah. he brought him, and he witnessed uh, Baba Tunde doing a uh, Santeria. Santeria you know, is, uh, and and you know, so much of Billy's playing is like that to me. It's very spiritual. Did you have? Did, well, did Bill, you? Do you have? Bill, Bill yeah. used to listen a lot, you know, and uh, and Bill was a determined cat. I mean, even from the um, Bill doing the, the drum and bugle core stuff, the rudimentary drumming style. Became was his was his basis of his foundation after the Boy Scouts, and he got very good at it playing tenor drum, and in uh, and the junior corps. And then as he got older, he wanted to graduate to one of the senior corps, and he uh, went from St. Catharines of Siena, which was a junior corps, to the Long Island Sunrises, which was a senior corps. And of course, just like anything else, you know, he had to he had to drag his little brother along because he had to go do this audition. He was everywhere with him, yeah, man. man. I always remember this. Bill you know, <laughs> goes in, he's trying to try out to be just a lead drummer, a snare drummer with the Sunrisers. And the guy who was leading the line at the time said, so, okay, man, I heard, I heard you're a badass. You know, uh, well, let me see what you can do. You know, Billy played some stuff. The guy said, yeah, okay, but can you do this? The guy, he's puffing on a cigarette, and he's doing this buzz roll with one hand. And then he got it faster. And, and Billy's like, well, not as fast as this guy. So the guy told him, he says, yeah, you know, you're okay, man, you know. When you, when you can do this, I'll, I'll, move, I'll move you to the front of the line. And Billy was like, wow, damn. It's humbling. He came back home yeah. and said, okay, man. So he started practicing on the rolls on a, on, a, on, a, on a rubber piece of rubber, you know, a rubber drum pad. Then, then he took that from a rubber drum pad to magazines. And as the reason I asked him why is it because a drum pad is going to bounce back. A magazine is not going to bounce back, you know. Oh. So, so, so that is what we crave on the Jake Fine version. Right, so then you have to, so you have to develop a different kind of touch to be faster. You know, and I hit it, waiting for the response of the rubber to bring the stick back up. You have, now you're, now you're, now you're playing. Now you, now you're doing it. And Billy worked on that shit, man. I, I mean, mercifully, mercilessly, until he got it. And. Uh, so he went back, it wasn't immediate, it wasn't like overnight, but he went back about a month later and, you know, said, hey man, I, I, I'm ready to try out for the front line again. The guy says, yeah, you, you think you got it?